Okay, well, eyes are on the big banks this week as many of them release their earnings. Among them, Goldman Sachs and Citigroup this morning, Bank of America on tap later this week. And then last week, we got J.P. Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo, which both reported earnings that beat Wall Street expectations. The question is, is now the time to add a bank to your portfolio, one of these stocks? Joining us now is David Bonson. He's the CIO of the Bonson Group and author of the new book, The Case for Dividend Growth. Investing in a post-crisis world, David. It's great to have you with us. What do you make of the results that we got this morning uh, from Goldman and City? Um, Goldman has just become very dependent lately on that uh, fixed income trading. It's a highly cyclical business, and it's one of the reasons that Morgan Stanley, post-crisis, tried to downtick the relevance of that in their business model because it's not as consistent. And Goldman is uh, experiencing that now. They'll have a huge quarter. They've had plenty of those lately. This was not a good one. What about last week, J.P. Morgan Chase having that blowout quarter, uh, yeah, and, and record-setting quarter? That's right, and I would argue that J.P. is uh, kind of proof of the opposite lesson. They have very consistent businesses in their mortgage origination, their credit card businesses, and just their basic consumer deposit banking is second to none. But also, they're way ahead of the curve on fintech, and they raised their dividend la in third quarter last year 40%. They were telling you well in advance how confident they were in their present business model and their execution. They've been a standout not just this last month and last year, but the last 10 years. I think for our audience, uh, there's this intrigue with David Solomon, the new uh, CEO of Goldman Sachs, right? And how he, in some ways, sort of plays to these uh, millennial tendencies. DJ Diesel? DJ Diesel, yes. He does DJ on the weekend. Yes. Uh, is this problematic for him now, the second quarter, uh, as CEO of this company, that no. they ha did have such a, a worrisome report today? Yeah, no, that's a great question, but it is not. I mean, Goldman is absolutely going to be fine. It's one quarter. No CEO in Goldman history has been judged by one quarter, and none ever will. Franchise is too strong. The talent, the intellectual capital is too strong. They just are going to have a lumpy business model. That's what they picked by design. Take us through the case for, for dividend growth, uh, your, your recent book. Why focus on this? What's the, what's the thesis behind it? Yeah, um, the thesis is, first of all, not that it is something we want to focus on now or 10 years ago or in 10 years, but rather all the above. We believe this to be an evergreen principle. It's something I built my career around. We manage $1.5 billion of client capital around these very principles. Um, you go back pre-financial crisis. I think that there had been in that lost decade the hangover from people getting away from the idea that cash flow matters. So that was sort of the aftermath of the tech bust. Then you go into the financial crisis and people really realized how important free cash flow was, not just balance sheet and not just accounting earnings that blew up all the banks. Fundamental, down, and sometimes boring, operating earnings that lead to greater dividend growth. So we are now through two different decades, two totally different decades, one of economic recovery, one of a real kind of stagnant market. We believe that dividend growth has shown itself to be a very solid, consistent way to invest. Uh, what about specific companies here, if you can yeah. speak to those? Because a lot of the companies yeah. that, that get the attention of, of our audience and people our age are, you know, companies in the Cheddar 50 Index. That's uh, right. Companies that may not be dividend players at this point. Or, or are, at this point is the key word, because I think that if you did a Cheddar 50 Index in the 90s, it probably would have had Intel, Qualcomm, Microsoft, uh, these types of companies. Cisco is notorious, and well, frankly, Apple. Steve Jobs would, I don't think, to this day have agreed to pay a dividend. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that companies grow up and they become dividend payers. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe that that's what you want out of a company, is to get to a point where you've matured your business model so much that the right thing to do is return capital to shareholders. That's the best return you can provide. Allowing so much free cash flow to build up that you can't do anything with it hurts shareholder returns. Now, in the case of some of the companies a lot of millennials are really interested in, they may not be there yet. They're not the type of companies that we like to own for our clients, but the fact of the matter is that uh, the ones that make it and survive will end up one day doing what Cisco, Qualcomm, Intel all did. They became very consistent, high quality balance sheet companies that pay out cash to shareholders. Does the current market, where we aren't expecting a ton of growth this year, does it force companies, uh, growth companies, to pay a dividend to get investors invested in shares? I don't think that it, that necessarily always aligns. It depends on management. Um, if a shareholder believes that operating earnings are going to be growing, they don't need a dividend to be attracted to the stock. Our argument is that the dividend tells us if, if operating earnings are likely to be growing. It's a sign from management of their own confidence. Stock buybacks are not. 
because they, they can cut them off at any time they want. They never, we don't really even know if they ever execute when they announce one. They don't have to, right? They can just announce a sort of uh, authorization. You don't know what they've done. A dividend is real cash. So I do think that in a high growth environment or low growth, especially if inflation were to tick up again, it's very low right now, it's not just a good dividend you want. You want the growth of the dividend. Mm -hmm. And that's what the book is about and that's what we've built our practice around. The Fed recently indicating that it's unlikely it will raise interest rates for the remainder of the year. How, do you, how are you reading into what the Fed is planning or how the Fed is communicating? what it is planning for the remainder of the year. Yeah, it's interesting. There's more quantity of communication from the Fed than there was when my career began over 20 years ago. And yet, I'm not sure there's more clarity from the Fed. We, we basically, three weeks before they stopped, were told we're not even close to the neutral rate. That was back in December. And then now we're told uh, that we're, we're completely on our hands. The Fed's not going to raise rates this year. Um, I'm not in the camp that they should be cutting, and I'm not really in the camp that they will be, but that second part is harder to forecast. What I do know is that the biggest thing that was really impacting markets was the quantitative tightening, and I don't think they're going back there anytime soon. Okay, David Bonson breaking it down for us. He's a CIO of the Bonson Group and author of the new book, The Case for Dividend Growth, Investing in a Post-Crisis World. Thanks, David. Thank Thanks, you. David.